Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, it's so good to see all of you online. Happy New Year to all. Um, thank you so much for joining us for today's Ask Me Anything session on the value of building with a co-founder. Um, firstly, uh, before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. Um, as for myself, I'm dialing in from the land of Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation in Brunswick, um, Victoria. I would also like to pay my respects to their elders, uh, past and present. Um, thank you so much um, again, everyone, for coming along. Um, this session tonight is really designed to shed light on the value of building with um, co-founders. I'm Rani. I'm community manager and scouting at Antler Australia. Um, tonight, we will have a conversation with uh, Abdul of Fitlo, our portfolio company founder who has built launched his company with us alongside not one, but two other co-founders. We will also have Nina Leong, our uh, growth associate, uh, moderating the panel. Um, you're definitely in for a treat tonight. Um, we'll start the session with an intro of Antla, and then we're also gonna dive then into the candid conversation with Abdul. Um, diving into his co-founder journey and experience building Fitflow with Antler. And again, this is an Ask Me Anything session. So at any point of the conversation, please feel free to contribute by addressing your questions, comments in the chat box. Um, we'll also have a dedicated time for Q&A. So by the time, if you feel comfortable to just raise your hand and come off mute and we can um, basically um, have you shoot your questions. Um, before we kick off, just a few general housekeeping. Um, please mute yourself if you're not speaking, just avoid any background noise. And if possible, we'd love to see uh, who we're speaking to. So please your, keep, keep your camera turned on if you can. All right, now let's get into it. Um, inviting Nina to introduce Antla um, and moderate today's discussion. Um, Nina, all yours. Thank you so much, Rani, and welcome everyone to today's AMA. Um, just to quickly introduce myself, my name's Nina. I'm a scout here in Antla, and I'm currently residing in Melbourne. Um, a really big part of my role is to bring on really exceptional founders onto Antla's pre-launch program and uh, guide them through the program as well um, and their experience um, as a founder. So um, uh, just to quickly introduce uh, Antler as well as a company. So we are one of the most active early stage investors in the world. Um, we span across 25 locations across six continents. And to date, we've got uh, assets under management of uh, a billion AUD um, Australian dollars. Uh, and uh, some of you might have seen as well, um, our CEO, Magnus, shared on his socials that we have made over 1,000 investments to date, which is uh, an awesome, awesome achievement given that the uh, given that Antler was founded in 2018. Um, a little bit about the uh, founders that we recruit for the co cohort. So this is one of the most common questions that I generally get asked is what are the type of founders that come into Antler? And the answer to that is that we live by the rule of a third, a third, a third. So we do a third uh, technologists and tech co-founders. These are like your CTOs, the people that actually build the product. Um, we've got a couple of examples here. So we've got Adeline um who was the CTO? He was the CTO and co-founder of Rightpool. Oh, sorry, yeah, Rightpool. Um, who has fourteen years of software engineering experience. So those are the types of profiles that we look for in our tech founders. We then also have our business operators. Um, these are the founders with really strong commercial experience and a lot of experience uh, bringing together like go to market. Um, products and building teams and also actively fundraising. Um, so typically these are the, these are the founders that will be selling the product that is being built um, as well as uh, defining the strategy. And then we've got your domain experts. So these are founders with uh, like 15 plus years of experience in a particular industry or founders who have done a PhD and are looking to commercialize their research. 
Uh, these founders are the basically like the the knowledge base of the founding team. So they are the ones that know the industry uh, really, really well and know exactly what the industry needs as well. Um, typically, our founding teams are made of two to three uh, founders. So not everyone will have like a, a founder that fits each of these uh, categories. Um, but typically, the founding team has uh, like traits or skill sets that span the, the all of these three. Um, a little bit about uh, the types of investments that Antler makes. So this is another really common question that we get asked is uh, what industries or what companies does Antler invest in? And the answer is that we are industry agnostic, meaning that we do uh, invest in a really diverse range of uh, industries and companies that sit with the, within those industries. Um, the only thing that we say is that we invest in technology companies. So any company that can be scaled by a tech. So um, this actually isn't up to date. This slide is not up to date with all of our recent investments. So we have made a lot more investments in Australia, but this is just to give an example of the uh, variety of the companies that we invest in spanning from consumer tech green tech, prop tech, ed tech, whatever tech uh, you can think of, uh, we typically have an investment uh, in that industry. Um, and then a little bit about the traction so far about uh, for Antler in Australia. So since launching, we have backed over 300 founders across 100 uh, businesses. And we've pulled out a couple of the uh, more well-known businesses that we've invested in so far. So the first one being uh, Path Zero in the climate tech space. Um, they provide solutions to collect and communicate carbon data, which is a really important thing nowadays in the field of sustainability reporting and things like that. Um, we've also got Upcover, who started off uh, providing insurance to gig economy workers um, and has now expanded to insurance to small, medium enterprise businesses. And then we've also got Zalient, who uh, processes data from cameras um, that is a lot quicker and faster than the traditional solutions that have been in place and that uh, the applications span across facial recognition, vehicle detection and security. Um, over to the right, we've got a, a couple of other select investments that we've made um, so far. And then at the bottom there is that is a couple of the co-investors that we sit alongside. So uh, these are the investors that we have existing relationships with so that when our portfolio companies get to raising their next round of funding, we have, you know, investors that we can introduce them to and we typically will invest alongside them as well. Um, so that's it about Antler. I'm now going to throw over to Abdul for a quick introduction to himself and to Fitflow, the company that he built uh, with Antler. So Abdul, the floor is yours. Thanks, Nina. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Abdul. I am the CEO and co-founder of Fitflow. Um, by way of kind of background i have always been kind of in technology i uh, was lucky enough to start uh, my career in uh, at car sales um and along the journey uh at a few kind of different startups um so I, I i love kind of what i do and and um have built a kind of career in in that space uh fitflow so what fitflow does is we help uh gym operators maximize their revenue by boosting member retention and engagement so that's actually quite different to the existing model within the kind of fitness landscape um, but what we do differently is we bring an approach that is driven by data um, and enable both operators and members the technology and engagement tools to actually kind of path or, or kind of uh, chart their own path so we've we've been uh out in market, I guess now with our initially beta and more recently launched our uh, first version of um, our core platform. And we are now available in over 10 gyms here in Melbourne, um, one actually in Singapore with well over 600 member users. And we've, uh, we've been, we've been, um, you know, on, on this kind of journey and um, going through ups and downs, but yeah, we've we've really kind of um enjoyed the 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 kind of partnership with Antler and the support we've we've uh, had. 
That's awesome, um, Abdul. It's so great to hear about um, where FitFlow is at now. Um, we spoke about this a little bit before the call, um, but can you talk us through some of the recent traction that you've gained um, with, with FitFlow? Yeah, so I, I think um, tra traction is uh, one of those funny things where it's like it's it's kind of relative, right? So we we have been working really, really closely with initially six beta partner gyms who were defined as our early adopters. And we actually had grand plans where um, we would launch with them over a month and then we'd go out to market. But such is the way uh, with with beta partners, early adopters, um, they're a wonderful source of feedback. And they they really helped us refine our solution and our platform. So we we've been we've just come out of beta. We are now live in 10 gyms, uh, like I mentioned, with well over 600 connected member users. And that is growing where our growth rate so far is is roughly kind of 10% month on month. Um, and that's really without much marketing. So uh, over the coming months, we we expect that to to massively grow and um, hopefully uh, be be um, in in you know roughly hundred gyms or more by kind of mid year. That's really really awesome. Uh, super super like cool to hear the amount of progress that you've been able to achieve so far. And given that it's the start of the year and everyone's got that new year's resolution to get <laughs> more, um, hopefully those numbers just keep increasing. Yeah, um, sure. Awesome. Thank you so much for giving us a bit of a um, update on your traction. I'd love to know now, Abdul, um, in your view, how was like, how did your prior experience help you form the idea of FitFlow and prepare you for the role of a founder in Antler? Or how did you go through the validation of uh, FitFlow? Yeah, great question. So I think I think my background lended me to because I have been in technology working in uh, both product and product marketing. Um, I'm, I'm one of those people that actually kind of looks at things and, and, you know, more specifically problems, um, and think, is there a better way, uh, this could be done. So I think that natural kind of, uh, bent of, of mine helped me to actually properly, I, I guess, or, or, or deeply look at a consistent problem that I had faced personally, which was, uh, going to the gym. I, I had always been um, a relatively kind of active person, played sports when I was younger and um, got into my adult life early on and uh, you know, got busy with work and um, trying to maintain a social life and just had no time to, to kind of um, maintain playing sports. So naturally the next place to go to is a gym. Um, and I tried a bunch of different gyms over the course of kind of, four years and quit every single one in kind of less than three months. Um, and, you know, if I, if I listened to kind of literature, I would be told that I was unmotivated and, and lazy, but that wasn't the case. I was, I was highly motivated and, and, you know, pretty active. I just struggled in the gym. So my, my previous experience of kind of working technology, having um, a kind of a passion for understanding problems um, meant that when I did kind of have that serendipitous, oh, hey, this is a consistent problem I've, I've, I've been facing. Um, how, how can I kind of look into this? And then uh, is, is a kind of long burn. So I, I, over the kind of next course of kind of say five years, um, thought about the problem, thought about the problem, and then, um, yeah, decided one day that now was, now was the time and, uh, yeah, went, went into it. That's awesome. Um, just curiously, like, what made you decide that you know, this was the time to go into it? I, I think, um, you know, personally, I, I had come to a point in my career where I had uh, enough kind of experience, right? So I, I had enough kind of reps around how to really uh, do due diligence on a problem. Um, so what, what I really focused on is um, really understanding all elements of 
my individual problem, then extrapolating that out and saying if I was unique or if this was common, because you do need that kind of volume, right, um, mm. to validate, okay, this this is something worthwhile kind of pursuing. Um, and I, I did that and kind of did initially primary research and secondary research, uh, looking at kind of the, the economic impact of it all. Um, and once I had got to that place, um, you really, then this is where Antler is such a great vehicle. You really kind of have two options, right? You um, you can try to go it alone, which yeah, you might hear that kind of rest story of an individual that kind of that you know going about it that maybe that like kind of Elon story, but that's but that's super rare. Whereas a uh, uh, kind of program or a platform like Antler um, really enables you that support to you know, a tap into kind of what you don't know and and have have the kind of support around what you don't know, but then kind of bring your own energy and and really kind of um, yeah g- give it a good crack so that was my journey i had done a bunch of research beforehand i had um an idea of kind of an mvp and had kind of started work on it but then uh joined the antler program and that's when things really accelerated that's awesome to hear um awesome so we'll move on to a couple of uh questions now uh regarding sort of like how you found your experience in antler and as well um you know how how you met your co-founders um but just as a reminder to everyone this is like an interactive ama so please feel free to raise your hand or pop a question in the chat um and we can answer them um you know during this conversation i'm very interested in having just a really casual uh, conversation here tonight so please um anything that abdul says or i say that piques your interest um please uh, pop it in the chat um so abdul can you elaborate on you know we spoke about this a little bit earlier today but um how you found your co-founder and you know how you managed your expectations when you were trying to look for your uh, co-founder in the antler residency um, and then also a little bit into the the skill sets of your uh, co-founders as well. Yeah, um, good question. So I'll be I'll be honest. Um, I suspect a few people uh, in the program in, in the next cohort will come in with ideas, right? Um, or maybe have got some progress and uh, you know can be typically looking for a either technical partner or a commercial partner. Um, and that was, that was kind of my case. I came in and I was, I had, I had a bunch of, you know, ideas formed of kind of what I was looking for. I was looking for a a kind of tech partner, um, a tech co-founder and I was skeptical and, and that was probably more of kind of a, you know, self kind of, uh, defense mechanism where I, I didn't want to get my hopes up too high um, but I still thought the program was going to be super uh, valuable so I think if you're one of those people who, who's coming in with this notion of I know exactly what I'm looking for that's okay but um, I think it was Joel I spoke to from Antler um, James I know Nina you and I had a conversation as well um, one of probably the best pieces of advice was enter the program with an open mind so that that I did that um and once once I kind of started the the program um in terms of finding a co-founder um there's a a great bunch of uh uh, I guess um carefully curated uh yeah I guess uh sessions to help you get to know your cohort um, your fellow cohort is uh, quite well. But for me, what what really worked was just keeping it simple. I initially focused on people who, um, uh, as, as much as you can understand, uh, aligned on a values level and then more specifically just kind of initial hit it off with interest points. Um, not that there had to be kind of a carbon copy, but just... Um, you know, where we had kind of like-minded uh, interests that we could have a conversation about. And so for me, uh, during during the program, um, I was lucky enough to actually find uh, quite a few people who 
A, resonated with the problem space that, that I was uh, looking to tackle. Um, but I also was open to the idea, um, maybe pardon the pun, of actually leaving my problem space and joining another one, right? So I, I did come in open-minded. Um, and and for me, I, I guess I was lucky enough to, to find not, not just one co-founder, but, but two. Um, and, and that was just because uh, there were two quality individuals. Um, they had interesting takes on the problem space and uh, we were very much aligned on a values level. Um, and, and then lastly, I think Antler does a, a great job of helping you kind of better understand your individual strengths um, and, and potentially kind of uh, areas or, or gaps. And um, yeah, we, we, we are now a, a team of three. That's awesome. That's yeah, really, really good to um hear. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question, just uh, leading on from that, and then tell a couple of questions that are in the chat. Um, but you know, when you were speaking about uh, the resources that Antler provides um, to better understand the other founders in the cohort, um, those resources are one is called the Fifty Founder Questions, which is basically a set of 50 questions that gets all of like the hairiest questions out of the way first so that you can have those conversations up front and they can be honest um, with someone who, you know, you're potentially exploring building a, a company with. And then the other one is fingerprint for success. So that is a platform where it's like uh, you input a bunch of sort of like information about yourself and then it um, spits out um, you and a, another founder and like where your like complementary, like wh where your strengths and weaknesses are as a team, essentially. Um, so uh, those are the types of resources that the Antler provides. So Abdul, I'd love to know, you know, did you find those resources helpful? Do you still refer back to them? Um, or like what sort of like your uh, feeling of how much of an influence they played in when you were choosing your co-founders? Yeah, they're, um, they're, they're actually super helpful and I highly recommend um, putting, you know, enough, enough time and effort into it because uh, with the 50, initially with the 50 kind of questions, um, what that helps you do is also, uh, I guess, think through your thoughts and your beliefs. The, the questions are, are great because the questions that um, aren't aren't about the short term they they're kind of about the medium and long term and you know I think they're they're kind of a, a good um, indication or at least they're indicative around values as well um, so the 50 founder questions are great for just understanding kind of how you would potentially um, think about certain situations or how you feel about certain uh, situations and how you deal with um, certain kind of instances. And then you then have the benefit of sharing that with a potential co-founder. Now, the way we did it is um, we did it over a beer um, on a Friday afternoon um, to, to kind of actually have, the, have more of a conversational, less interviewee type um uh, environment or vibe i should say and so that was that was great for us and our team and um you know it did it did kind of enlighten us to different personal situations different experiences and it's it's not all about kind of you know being fully aligned on on everything it's just more so about um understanding maybe different perspectives you, you get a sense of you know all types of things like kind of risk appetite and, and whatnot so that's a 50 founder questions. They're great. Um, F4S is addictive as well um, for all the same reasons uh, around the 50 founder questions. Um, it, it helps you kind of understand yourself and more often than not, it is right um, yeah, around kind of your tendencies, uh, your characteristics, strengths and whatnot. Um, and then when you kind of couple that with comparing that with, your potential co-founders the, the best thing about it is it 
highlights gaps, right? Um, and it highlights potential strengths. Um, and so you come away with it with a level of kind of enlightenment around, okay, as a team, we're quite strong here um, and there could be a gap here. So you you kind of walk away from it with more than anything, just um, a better understanding about yourself, your co-founder, and, and most importantly, how you might pair up or, yeah, come come together as a team of three. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome to hear. And yeah, you're completely right in that like F4S is super addictive. Um yeah. once I've I found that once uh people, you know, complete their profile, it's like all you do is you just compare profiles like every day, yeah. like everyone in the cohort. Um and it's a really good interactive way to actually see sort of like where like your strengths in one team will be completely different to your strengths in another team, right? It just really depends on like who you're um, comparing your results with. Um, so let's move on to a couple of the questions in the chat now. Um, so Satish is keen to know what validation techniques worked for you and if you have any recommendations for uh, trying to validate an idea. Yeah, um, good question. So. Uh, I, I would even kind of go a step back and um, I would say I really tried to quarantine uh, the problem. I had, I had, like I mentioned, I had personally experienced the problem. So the, the, the problem of, um, you know, going, going to the gym sucks. And that's, that's kind of like, yeah, the, um, but what what I did is I kept refining the problem before arriving at an idea. Um, and the way that I did that was I interviewed a bunch of people, initially started with friends and family around kind of their gym experience, whether they would had it or not, then um, went to uh, you know, my local gym and just, just asked people if they, they would be okay um, to just have like a quick kind of 10 minute conversation. Um, I coupled that with a survey that I sent out. And I say this to say that I really obsessed about the problem and the unique insight around fit flow is we believe, so th this came from probably tens of hours of conversations and, and and doing kind of primary research. Um, what, what came out was for us, people, it's not motivation that's, the, that's a problem. People start off with either a positive trigger or a negative trigger when they're starting their fitness journeys. And mm -hmm. it's in fact, once they arrive in the environment of a gym, right, that motivation over time gets eroded and that's because of things like lack of knowledge intimidation of the environment um being overwhelmed not knowing what to do so our our difference is we are not a fitness app although there is an app around what we do we are a platform that initially digitizes the gym with nfc tags on each piece of equipment and then there is a web portal for operators to be able to provide personalized support and engagement and onboarding. So they're able to set up their new members up for success from day one. And then members have agency. They're not always relying on a PT or not always relying on somebody being there to help them. They have their app where they can kind of learn and, and kind of uh, feel a bit more um, confident on their own kind of journey, right? And I say that to say that the initial idea, because it's only natural to, to kind of think about an idea, the initial idea was um, how good would it be if there was just a fitness app that worked, right? So we'll have a fitness app and we'll have a bunch of rewards and streaks and rah, rah, rah. And after, after getting really clear on the problem and arriving at kind of uh, doing a couple of different cuts of hypotheses or hypotheses um, and tweaking the problem statement, we arrived at a solution that's unique. There's, there's not much like what we're doing out there in the market, if, if at all. So my, my simple, simple feedback would be um, your idea will evolve. So validation is 
continuous on your idea, but your problem statement should stay relatively consistent and mm-hmm. you just need to need to fall in love with with that problem. Yeah, very, very wise um, words of wisdom there, Abdul, and something that we also tend to hammer into our founders as well is to fall in love with a problem statement, not the solution. Um, okay, cool. Um, a question from Jenny. Um, if you sort of reflect back to your time in the Antler uh, cohort, what would you say? What would you say was like the biggest surprise that you found out about? either yourself or your um your idea or your your yeah your business idea yeah um great question so i i think my initial kind of advice would be go in with an open mind um you know if you get selected you, you are pretty good at what you do um so you're with kind of a peer group of other kind of outstanding people um, so there is a ton to learn. Um, so I think that's, that's you know, Ant- Antler is a great platform and the team at Antler are wonderful. And that's, that's true, but equally as wonderful as some of the people that you'll meet in your cohort, right? They, they are PhDs, they are, um, you know, highly experienced executives. They are, you know, super talented young technologists um so i think uh my my advice and and upon kind of my reflections is i was surprised at how much i learned beyond kind of just my idea um how many people that i'm still kind of friends with um from my cohort um and even the cohort prior because you do kind of have some connections with them as well so i would say go in with an open mind um you'll meet a lot of fantastic people and you'll learn a lot. And just by by kind of the process of how Antler run the program, how they challenge you, your idea and your problem space um, will get accelerated in a way that, you know, you, you couldn't do yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. And um, to your point of like, you know, there's, there's a plethora of people that you meet like, right? Like if a cohort size is, I think your size, Abdul, was about 70 founders. Um, in that 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 network of 70 founders is already like your first, your first sort of like stage of connections, right? And then you think about all of the people that they then know. It just becomes this massive, massive network of incredible people that you can get connected to and therefore you can basically like meet anyone from any industry regardless of what it is through a warm introduction because you've been a part of like the antler cohort um and that I think is something that's one of the really unique things about antler is just the strength of the connections that have that are made um within the program um okay cool so I'm going to combine two questions here um, so we've got a question from YY, who, what is, which is, how do you make sure um, there's a fair level of commitment amongst the co-founders, uh, which I'll answer really, really briefly. Um, but the question I want to combine it with is uh, Nathan's, which is, what are some red flags to look for when speaking to potential co-founders? So in terms of the commitment um, from Antler, we ensure that all of the founders are committed to building a business full-time. And so everyone that comes into the residency is there on a full-time professional capacity because obviously as investors, like we want you to build a business, um, you know, even like beyond Antler, right? Like beyond your participation in the program, we want you to be building this business full-time to maximize your opportunity for success of the business. And then from a co-founder's perspective, like you want all of your, you want your co-founder to be committed as committed to the business as you are, um, which ideally is just full-time, right? So that's, like in coming into Antler, that t- level of commitment is already at, like, you know, somewhat guaranteed um, in that everyone is there full time. You know, the next stage of their career is to build a business. Um, so, Abdul, maybe you can speak a little bit to um, the the red flags to look for when speaking to potential co-founders. Yeah, uh, another great question. So uh, I think um, I mentioned earlier, you, you, you want to be aligned kind of at a values level um, and, and and that's maybe a bit lazy um, of me to say that 
what I mean by that is you are you are this is this is as tough as you think it is and and then some, right? You are building a business from scratch and you will have your know, great support, but you will have to do it. Um, and there'll be lots of moments of doubt. There'll be lots of kind of late nights, there'll be lots of you know, uncertainty and things that that just broadly kind of you know, are gonna push you. So if if you kind of work back from that, you want commitment as as uh, the question and, and Nina kind of alluded to, like commitment's just kind of a, a no brainer. So you just want to make sure that 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 is um you know there to begin with. And then after that, um values can mean kind of philosophy, like uh you know what how you know, are, are you are you a person that works 40 hours a week and and that can be completely fine there's nothing wrong with that but you know if your co-founder works at you know, 100 hours a week um that will probably naturally bring up some kind of point of tension so you know probably less obvious red flags because again if you make it this far some of those things the antler team kind of take care of for you right so it's it's more it's more around are we aligned philosophically are we aligned kind of you know um around ways of working um and then and then off the back of that i would say just don't shy away from you know challenging each other um or having those uh you know direct conversations um but certainly, you know, communication style is is important to to kind of be aligned on. Um, yeah, they, they they would be they would be the the things I'd say look out for. Um, and it's it's very rare that there would be like a real obvious red flag um, that that you know would appear at, at a cohort level. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree, and probably. Um... Just a, just a caveat on that is that red flags will look different to um, different people, yeah. right? So it's like, you know, what's a red flag for um, one person might not necessarily be for another. So it really is like that. That's why, you know, the tools that we give, like the 50 founder questions, they're a really important self-reflection tool for you to think about. And then from there, you can understand like, what are, what are the things that I can compromise on? But then what are the things that I don't want to compromise on? Um, and then you'll soon pretty quickly like be able to uh, understand um, those things and then make your journey of finding a co-founder a lot easier. Um, okay, cool. Um, moving on, I'm just having a quick look through the questions. Probably one from Zach. Um, so he says, as a non-technical founder myself, I'd love to learn more about the technical journey of FitFlow. Um, what was the experience like evolving it from an early MVP to a full product? And how did you manage the team and tech build as the CEO? Yeah, this uh, I, I saw this question in chat, and I was I was hoping you'd ask it, uh, Nina. Um, I would, I would say, as a non technical founder, and this probably just goes broadly, whether you are a technical founder or a domain expert, I would say the technical journey of FitFlow initially was me learning. So I I um, tried to build an MVP just before the Antler program, um, a really basic uh, solution. And um, I had learned a platform called Bubble, which if you don't already know, I'm sure you will know and, and you know you will probably try for your own MVPs. Um, and so initially, technically, it, it was about me getting kind of an understanding and, and learning. Um, I then... Uh, worked with some uh, kind of like a, a contractor to help accelerate the build of the MVP because if I had built it myself, it would have taken just as long as it would have taken to build up the full thing. Um, and the the reason for that is, is because speed is super important just uh, across any kind of startup life cycle. Um, so I built, I tried to, I started building the MVP, then got somebody to help me build the MVP. And so by the time the program 
um, had started, I had the MVP. Uh, I had managed to get it into two beta gyms um, who who were early adopters, believed in their kind of uh, the, the future of FitFlow. And so by the time I started the program or as a program was happening and we were getting into kind of um, the, 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 the pitching later stages, uh, I had a bunch of data points which I could refer to. So my, my advice is kind of give it a crack. You don't need to have uh, or wait for a CTO as a non-technical founder. There are solutions and there are pathways where you, and, and you know, your MVP should be something that you are embarrassed of. And, and I was, um, and it solved a really specific um, problem. What, what I wanted to get to was understood my problem statement and then distill that down to um, what, is, what is one or two things that I can kind of get signals or proof points that I'm on the right track with the MVP. Um, so it, it really shouldn't take longer than a month um, if, if you're doing it yourself or with uh, an agency and you kind of want to get it out there quickly. Now, the experience with building going from an MVP to the full product was at that point, I had my co-founder Shadman, who's our CTO. Um, he was a gun and oh, he is, he is a gun. Um, and he, he essentially, we decided to just start again. So we left the MVP and built a full uh, platform from scratch. And, you know, probably one thing I'll say as a non-technical founder, as a CEO or you know, whatever role you're, you're, you're playing is you, ne you need to, you need to be in the details as much as it allows you to understand um, the, the kind of feel of the team, right? Um, you're, you're in this together technically you are always going to have to initially at this early stage, you're going to have to make compromises. You're, you're not going to have, and that might be compromise on feature set, or that might be compromise on how, how in depth you can go with a certain solution, um, you know, functionality, what have you. So as, as a CEO, you know, you, you need to be able to understand and support your CTO um, at least insofar as you can make, informed decisions now it doesn't serve you and you will not have the time whatsoever to get so technically in the details and so um you you'll need to kind of um you'll need to kind of manage that and and kind of yeah walk that kind of fine line i hope that answers the question awesome Thanks, um, Abdul. Yes, I agree, Zach. That was really, really um, solid and brilliant advice. And I do believe that Zach is in a really similar position to when you first, um, before you started Antler, Abdul. Um, okay, cool. I'm going to answer, um, and to give you a little bit of a break, Abdul, I'm going to answer a question that's come from VJ, which I think is, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's um, at what stage of the program do you conduct the market research to understand the addressable market? Um, and so the answer to that is that uh, with the Antler program, it's run in two distinct um, stages. So the first is called the formation and validation stage. And then the second is the due diligence stage. So market research is done in the first stage where you, uh, as Abdul was explaining before, like you validate your problem space by doing your market research in the form of like sending out surveys or like talking to experts in the field or your target consumer group. So that is the stage in which validation is done in terms of like the antler residency. If it happens that the problem space that you're trying to address um, doesn't have a wide enough addressable market, the Antler team will be very um, transparent in telling you that. Um, we'll either say, you know, like we don't believe that this is a large enough addressable market or we will say to you, um, we don't think it is, but we're happy to be proven wrong. So like, you know, these are the things that we would like to see or these are the things that we um, we would need to see for you to be able to prove us wrong. And um, if you can sort of like uh, achieve that, then, you know, we're very happy to also, um, you know, 
uh, take take your word on it as well. Um, so I would say that that's yeah that that's kind of like what happens um, in the cohort is that yeah like typically the journey is that we're just really transparent with each other like you know we're not really interested in wasting anyone's time like if we are really high conviction or low conviction in a problem space like you'll you'll generally know pretty quickly. Um, Okay, cool. So uh, moving on to a question that is from uh, Nile. I apologize if I've, I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, so with uh, this one's for you, Abdul. Um, so with various options available for early stage VC, what are some of the factors that influenced your decision to choose Antler over others? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so... For me, I had, um, as I kind of mentioned, I had some some decent clarity on on the problem space, um, and then um, I had a pretty big ambition, um, like really big ambition for for kind of fit flow. Once I really understood the size of the problem, um, understood the market landscape around sports tech, fit tech, and just the overall kind of um, health and wellness um, kind of value chain, which fitness sits in. So once that became kind of apparent um, for me, I was looking for potential, um, potential investors who would be additive to that journey and Antler is certainly that. So beyond kind of helping you kind of connect with some highly talented people in different domains and, and with different skill sets, Antler is global. And that was probably one of the, the, the biggest kind of contributing factors for me to kind of um, to, to kind of really think about you know the mid to you know hopefully super long term. Uh, future of, of fit flow. So, um, other other you know th there are certainly other pathways. Um, there are you know the the Australian market um, is you know is 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 growing and Antler's a big champion of that, growing the overall ecosystem. But I think really you you know for me personally, it was really about who who would I trust? Who do I think is going to be additive and helpful to the early stages of, you know, fit flow and, and you know, increasing the chances of success and an antler was um, a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and just to add to that, and it's something that I always say to founders is that like the, the founder investor relationship should be a two way street, right? It's like, you should be choosing the right investors for yourself and for your business, just like the same way that VCs choose the right founders for their investment um, philosophy. So it really should be a two-way street. Like you need to really see what value is this investor going to have for me? Like what are they going, what are they really going to be able to bring to the table that um, is in line with what I need? And that should be influencing your decision as well. Um, okay, cool. Um, I'm going to answer a couple of questions from um, Edward. Um, so um, Edward, there's there's a question that I'll that I'll answer first, and then I'll uh, throw it over to you, Abdul. But the first question, um, Ed, is that what if a founder has already done the market research? So um, we will, if if you're already coming in with an idea for Antler and you're already like you know starting to build out your idea, we'll dissect that in the interview. And I'm sure Abdul can talk about this, but um, it's typically in the final interview that's done. Like it is not going to lie, if you are coming in with an idea, it is going to be a challenging interview um, in that we will basically dig into like, why is this problem? Like, why are you committed to solving something in this problem space? And are you actually the person that's going to be doing it? Like, are you the person that's going to be driving the change in this problem space? And so we do that because if you're coming in with an existing idea, obviously like, you know, we, we do encourage you to be open to changing ideas, but we do also understand that, you know, founders, they will stick to, they, they will have more of like a, uh you know, a soft spot for the idea that they've already started validating prior to coming into that antler journey. And so that we, we dissect that in the interview process just to make sure that, you know, 
if you do want run with your idea in the Antler program, that we have the initial view already that it is a space that we would invest in. And so that is another way of just kind of like saving everyone some time, just making sure that we're all on the same page in terms of the, the industry that um, you're looking to build a business in. Um, and then his second question um, is for you, Abdul. So how far along were you with FitFlow playing, uh, prior to joining Antler? Yeah, so I, I would... I started um, researching the problem in November. Um, I think I applied for Antler in January and um, started in the May cohort. So um, I, from November and December, I was just in research uh two months of kind of just understanding the problem um documenting everything down um had a couple of different initial kind of rough ideas of potential solutions um but by the time i went through the interview process um with antler um which would mean a you know it's, it's a really great point is you, you will you will get grilled um so the least you could do is again just understand the problem your idea will change and um you know you look at kind of any business uh the solution evolves markets evolve customer needs evolve technology evolves so um again being clear on on the problem space um the market and your unique view and what is kind of your spark around it like wh why you Having having clarity around that is is super important, and so I think that's that's at a base level. I I had spent eighty percent, maybe ninety percent of my time on that, and by the time I I joined um, Antler, by the time the cohort started, like I mentioned, we had halfway built the MVP, um, and I was very clear about uh, the what I was looking for in the MVP, and you know like like any kind of uh, startup concepting, uh, you know, having uh, research or ideas on paper are, are great, right? You need to go through that process, but nothing, nothing um, gives you insights and understanding like getting something out to market. And so that's that's a whole point of the MVP. So I had by the time the program started, I think two weeks into the program, um, we had launched in both gyms. Um, and so that that was that kind of worked out neatly in terms of timings for the you know, the, the kind of um, validation stage for for me part of the program. Yeah, yeah, that's um that's that's really really great um insights. There there is a really quick question um here as to why the antler te team picked Abdul and his idea, and the simple answer is is exactly what Abdul said. Like he understood the problem space so well. Um, and he, you know, was also able to attract two amazing co-founders um, on his mission and his vision for his uh, project space. Um, the team, we saw them work together for, you know, essentially 12 weeks and they worked together so well as well. Like they had so much chemistry between each other. Um, Shadman even moved from, I, I don't know where he was, but he moved to Melbourne. Sydney. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was, it was originally located in Sydney and he moved to Melbourne that's where Abdul and Darren are based um, and that just shows the genuine level of commitment that they all have to each other and to building uh, the business of FitFlow. Um, so we have like five minutes left so Abdul I'm going to um, flick you over one last question from Arun which is can you share some of the insights on what the pitch was to gyms that triggered them to commit um, to the beta? Yeah. <laughs> so um the pitch the pitch evolves, right? Um but the the general premise was um and, and this is a unique insight, um is that retention is actually the biggest problem for gyms. But there is this kind of you know long held belief and you know misconception that gyms just want to uh, sign up as much members as as they can, and um, 
hope hope to God that they that they don't join. But what the the, the kind of subsequent of that is, um, and this was uh, with the research I did, um, gyms actually have the highest or one of the highest failure rates of any small business or new business started. Um, so they they fail three times higher than the average kind of industry um, or the average for uh, for all industries. So the the pitch the pitch to gyms was really actually quite simple. It is, hey, you've spent all this money and all this hard work acquiring your members, and you are seeing them leave um, in high droves. Well, we have uh, a piece of technology which can help you engage them and support them. And then you can you can really get to uh, personalize your relationships with them. And therefore, they're much more, much more likely to stay. And the longer they stay, the more margin accretive they are to you. And every every gym owner um, got, got that, uh, uh, that premise. And so it was actually quite easy, much easier than, and I'd, yeah, this may be not great advice, but is much easier than I thought. Um, and even during during the Antler process to go from two beta customers to try to get six um, uh, actual uh, two MVP customers and six beta customers, um, that that was quite easy. We we were oversubscribed, so we had another twenty gyms who were interested in doing it, but we couldn't facilitate that, and so they are now becoming now. Um, sales targets that's awesome that's so, such uh like great news to hear bill and i think it speaks to you know the the fact that you understood the problem space so well which made it like essentially a really easy process to sell into gyms because like you know um you were so knowledgeable in the field and like you know you really understood how your product could not only help consumers but also help gyms uh retain <laughs> their consumers as well um, okay, cool. So that's it for tonight. So I would like to, you know, thank you so much, Abdul, for being such a great, um, great guest tonight. And also thank you so much to everyone else um, in the audience. You've all been such a great, warm, engaging audience. And thank you everyone for your questions. Um, just a really quick reminder that applications, if you haven't applied yet, are still open. Um, so please submit your application in. Please connect with uh, Rani myself and Abdul on uh, LinkedIn please stay in touch and um, hopefully we'll uh, see you all in the near future best Bye. of luck everyone thank you